Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here having this chat with you. My name is Julio. I will present the work entitled Metrics of Recovery for Understanding Additive Effects of Perturbation in the Microbial Community Suffering Eutrophication. So I wouldn't know a better way to start this presentation if not defining what is a perturbation together with you. And most of the people would agree that a lake being hit by a storm is considered as a perturbation, that an oil spill in a water body is considered a perturbation, that the superficial runoff of a river entering in, in a lake very severely can be considered as a perturbation, which is not so common, is to agree that, for instance, the cyclic turbid state of an eutrophic lake is not being considered as a perturbation. A bit more obvious that day and night cycles will not be considered as a perturbation to the system. And maybe for everyone, there is this one that a dog jumping in the lake would not be considered as a perturbation. What all the perturbations have in common is this aspect of being transient, to not be permanent in time, to be stochastic, so to not happen in cyclics, and to bring this idea of change. But why to study not only perturbations, but the additive perturbations? Let's think in a very simple system. For instance, uh, a clear water state of a lagoon. This lagoon is being hit by a storm. This is storm will clearly cause a perturbation that brings the system out of equilibrium. For instance, making it turbid for a certain period of time. If the lagoon has the proper feedbacks to go back to the previous state, it will do so having a counter response. This response to the storm plus the counter response determines a time of response to the event or time to respond to the perturbation. What is the matter of fact here for active perturbations is, let's consider the example of climate change with extreme weather events being every time more frequent. By the time that the frequency of those extreme weather events, they become larger or higher, then the delta T of the recovery, we start to have a system that did not recover a previous perturbation being hit by a second one, which is categorized an additive perturbation. Another situation where it's possible where you have change in the driving force, for instance, eutrophication, which is the, the case of this work hitting the system, and the eutrophication will not change the delta F, the frequency of the storms, for instance, but it may change the delta T, the time of response to the event, ending up at the same stage with the possibility of having additive perturbations. But what would be the whole of eutrophication in this process? Why eutrophication? Eutrophication basically means adding nutrients. And when you add nutrients, what you're doing, a matter of fact, is adding energy to the system. From one side, everybody would agree that by adding energy to the system, you would have an increase in biomass, and biomass can stabilize the system. Biology has the potential to stabilize physical chemical parameters. But also, more energy in the system means that the system can have more trophic levels, more trophic complexity, which may represent a higher gamma of compensatory processes to counterbalance the effect of the perturbation, or it can represent also that the system has no more functional redundancy to be able to cope with a perturbation. But on the other hand, having more energy in the system may represent as well that in, in the event of, of a perturbation, you may have a higher energy release at the same time. And this can result in higher displacements, or this can result in higher times to recover, hypothetically. And that's exactly what is the objective of this study, to assess if eutrophication can increase the peak of response after a perturbation, if it can increase the time to recover after a perturbation, and also if it can increase the variability of the response after the perturbation. So for that, what we've done was to go to Natural Lake in the Netherlands and we draw 550 liters of water. We filter it with a two millimeters mesh to remove all the microinvertebrates. So we mainly focus on the microbial loop. Here we acclimatize this, uh, this water for three weeks at 22 degrees with photo period of 16 hours of light, 18 hours of dark, in about 500 to 600 looks. And an indoor mesocosms are located in Terra. 10 liters carboys as the ones that you can see here. 
So we had 18 carboys divided in three treatments of six replicates. First treatment, the control received no eutrophication over time. So amount of total phosphorus, amount of time, days of the experiment, control, no eutrophication. Other two eutrophication curves composed the treatments. One with a strong curve of eutrophication, one with a very strong curve of eutrophication. And obviously to be able to quantify recovery from perturbations, we have to apply perturbations to the system. So to do that, basically, we remove a part of the water from the cause to a separate container. The separate container was treated with 10 milligrams per liter of hydrogen peroxide overnight before being bring back to the original system. So the effect of the perturbation from hydrogen peroxide was quantified on a every other day basis using the phytopump for pigment-based community dynamics. We follow the nutrient dynamics in the system. We have the control of physical chemical parameters as light and temperature, and we have some size traits on particle size distribution. We end up with time series, which every line here and those graphs are a different replicate with three treatments, control, mid-strong, and strong in basically three big chunks of perturbation, P1, P2, and P3. So from those curves, from those responses, we automated the script to calculate the baseline, the post-event condition, and the peak, so we could drive eight different metrics of recovery. So what we've done is you have your system, you have the response to the perturbation, we determine the baseline, we determine the post-event condition, we set the peak, and from that we calculate things as max displacement, time to displacement, time to recover, height of the peak, area of displacement, area of recovery, percent change of displacement to the peak compared to the baseline, and percent change in recovery consisting the comparison between the post-event condition and the initial baseline. So how does that look in the actual data? Baseline, peak, post-event condition, the area, and for instance this one you can see that the post-event condition happens in a different level from the baseline. This percent change is the percent change displacement and this percent change, sorry, the percent change recovery, and this is the percent change displacement. So how much it displaced compared to the baseline. A few other examples and results. The first result that I would bring to you is a stability versus max displacement. As I told you before, nutrients can increase biomass and biomass can increase stability. And this is something that we actually have seen in the experiment. We have in red the control, the blue is the strong treatment, the green is the mid-strong treatment, so the two receive eutrophication and red in control for P1, P2, and P3, the three perturbations we've done. Here is the amount of total pigments in micrograms per liter. We can see that there is a strong increase in pigments along the eutrophication curve. What we can see also on that is that as more pigments the system had, more it resisted to change. Here in the y-axis we have percent change to displacement, so how far the system goes compared to the, to the baseline. As more negative the number, further it displaces, as closer to zero, less it displaces, with a zero being 100% change. So you can see, for instance, that the treatments that had uh, a eutrophication process going on, they have a trend to be more resistant to change. They have a higher capability to stabilize the perturbation. However, on the other side, when we assess the individual effects on the perturbation one, perturbation two, and perturbation three, we can easily see comparing control with the treatments that the max displacement on the eutrophic systems was much higher than in the control for all the treatments. So this clearly poses a trade-off for us that nutrients, in a matter of fact, they really can increase the stability of the system, but they also, at the same time, they're capable to increase the amount of displacement 
after the system lose its stability. The second result that I would like to bring to you regards to the time for recovery. So here you can see in the y-axis the normalized time of recovery based on the different intensities of the perturbation in P1, P2, and P3. We can see that from P1 to P2 there was a trend of longer recovery times in all the systems. But after in the P3, when we analyze the whole trend, we see that the control ends up pretty much at the same place it started, while the control and uh, while the treatments they end up with what I would say it's a faster recovery compared to the control. That's a bit the opposite what we would expect from the assumptions at the beginning of the experiment, but after having a deeper look, for instance, in the percent of recovery, so how much, how close is the post-event condition compared to the baseline, being one a hundred percent similar and zero a hundred percent change, we can see that all the treatments actually lost the capability to recover along the time, but in special the two traffic treatments and P3, they had 100% change. What does that actually mean? Is that the perturbation moved the system to another tire, for instance, that was the pre-event condition. The perturbation brings the system to this tire here, and the perturbation just end up and the system remained there. So the system lost completely its capability to recover. And that's one of the reasons why those times are so low. Instead of having this score of increasing and then after bouncing back, the whole perturbation ends up in a new baseline, in a new shift in the system uh, that is just as high as the peak was. So that clearly signalizes us that we have to have a lot of caution when we are assessing times of recovery, very special when we have systems that do not recover to the place they were before. And the third uh, result that I would like to show you here very briefly is this one with the coefficient of variation on the y-axis, so how much the standard deviation varies compared to the mean. Here in the x-axis we have the days. The red lines represents the moments of the perturbation as before, red is for the control, blue and green for the traffic treatments. We can clearly see that eutrophication increased the variability of the response during the peak of the events and along the time of the experiment going from time zero to a time 100, we can see that the variation of the eutrophic treatments tend to be much higher than the control, inclusive on the moments that the system is stable in the baseline. So, what we see summarizing is that the CV increased during the disturbance and along the gradient of the disturbance, we see the same process. But those are preliminary results. We still had an assess how different those scores are. But at this point, what we can present to you is that there is a clear difference in coefficient of variation when the system is suffering eutrophication or not. So as a conclusion for those short results that we've bring to us, it seems to really have a trade-off between biomass and nutrients, eutrophication, biomass, and stability of the system, and the amount of energy that is released, especially in the amount of energy that it's displaced, so how far the system can go. We couldn't see a clear signal in the time to recovery, mostly because the system didn't recover. Uh, here we are not capable to associate uh, secondary trade-offs between biomass and traffic levels or energy release and compensatory and functional redundancy processes, uh, especially because our system is a closed system, suffering a strong artificial selection by hydrogen peroxide, and we do have local extinction that cannot be resupplied by meta-community dynamics, for instance, which is very important for resilience and resistance uh, process. Uh, I'd like to finish with a take-home message from the main uh, results that we, we've discussed here is eutrophication potentially delay the responses. They increase the net effect of the perturbation and they can definitely increase the variability uh, of the responses into the system. And this probably 
makes the system more prone to additive effects of perturbation a long time. And this is a very special case if we are entering the future of more frequent extreme weather events. So thank you. I'm very much open to questions and clarifications that you have about the presentation. Um, thank you very much.